Okay, so thanks Lance for asking me to come and, and uh, present today. Um, definitely a timely uh, matter or timely uh, topic, especially for people that are find that even though we didn't run into some nicer weather into fall and later grazing, there's still problems that can be associated with limited feed supplies. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is how does the nutritional requirements of an animal change over time and using different types of byproduct feeds or straws or canola green feed, canola silage, how do these things impact what needs to be done there's always problems with nitrates and sulfur concerns, depending on what you're trying to feed. A little bit on, uh, I'll just briefly mention a little bit about water quality. We won't really go into it much. Protein sources, feed waste problems, liquid molasses on straw bales or low quality hay bales, grain processing. And then how do you evaluate if the ration is good for the cow or not? And if you don't feed properly over the winter, what happens to cow productivity? Come on here, computer. So with the changing uh, times of the year and nutritional requirements of that animal, you can see that at weaning, in this slide it happens, occurs in September, but it doesn't matter which month you are. When you dry that cow off, her nutrient requirements drop by 25% compared to when she's lactating. As the calf grows and develops, you can see that the nutrient requirements start to increase. And then at the start of calving, the protein and energy requirements are probably almost to the peak, partly through the uh, first two months of, of calving you have the highest nutrient requirements because that's when the peak lactation occurs. And then as lactation starts to decline at two to 3% milk production per month, then your nutrient requirements come back down. Now, it's not only that the requirements change, it's also related to what is being provided and uh, how it impacts the cow function itself. So, this is a slide about trace mineral status in, in cattle, but you can apply the same principles to energy and protein as well. So once you start seeing a decline in nutrients being provided, the first thing that will be compromised is the immunity of the animals. They'll become more susceptible to the common diseases that are out there. And also the other thing that happens is your enzymes, which are definitely uh, a big part of the whole metabolic function, they tend to improve the efficiency of when the animal's digesting the feeds using the nutrients. Without the enzymes, it's more difficult to use it efficiently. After you lose your immunity and enzyme functions, the next thing to be uh, compromised is the ability of the calf to grow or a cow to gain weight. Also, you're going to have a loss of reproduction function. Either it's going to take longer for those cows to uh, come back and cycle, or the actual conception rates will go down. So it's all uh, gradual changes and, and increases in in problems, NRC requirements, which we use for uh, figuring out what the nutrient requirements are for animals or for cattle, that's the minimum. And once you get below the NRC minimums, you get into the deficiency uh, stage of the, of the problems. And these are when you get clinical signs happening. Uh, if it's, you know, either downer cows, milk fevers, uh, thin cows, a lot of open cows, it all happens. And then it takes a substantial amount of time before you can build back up. So for example, if you're short of vitamin A, it may take two or three months 
to real rebuild the stores in that animal so that there's enough there to meet the cow's requirements and also the fetus requirements. So leaving vitamin and mineral supplementation until two or three months before calving generally results in a decrease in animal function and immune function as well. When we're looking at the major nutrients, uh, the proteins, calcium, phosphorus, energy, uh, the first limiting nutrient philosophy is what we try to do. So if you look at the barrel on the left, you can see that at that point, the protein is the limiting factor in that ration. So you'll only be able to use the nutrients as efficiently as your first limiting nutrient. So on the right-hand barrel, you can see that they increase the amount of protein in that ration. And the next thing that becomes balanced needs to be improved is the amount of energy provided to those animals. And as you fix the energy, the next one would be phosphorus. So it's a continual cycle of trying to evaluate what's available to the animals, what are they utilizing, and how much is being supplied. So it's a continual battle as the animal becomes heavier into calf or into lactation, or if you're looking at feeder calves, the higher your rate of gain, the more, more nutrients the animal's gonna need. So how do we determine what is actually required by the animal? It all depends on the type of animal that's being fed. Is it a bull maintenance, uh, not growing anymore? Is it a cow that's uh, in lactation versus in mid-pregnancy? What's the condition of the cow? A thin cow will require 1,400 pounds more hay just to stay warm over the winter compared to one that is in good condition. Is the animal a 600 pound steer or a 1,500 pound cow? Really makes a big difference. Are they protected from the wind and the weather uh, so that they aren't wet and they aren't uh, in a cold stress situation. And the last thing, if you're looking at growing animals or even replacement heifers, how much gain do you want those animals to have? So a couple of rules of thumb that I use is for, for cows, mature cows, in mid-pregnancy, late pregnancy, and after calving, the protein requirements are 7, 9, and 11%. And that relates to the amount of growth that that calf is doing, 65, 70% of that total calf growth occurs in the last three months of pregnancy. Therefore, you need more energy and protein to develop the fetus. And then after calving, instead of developing the fetus, they're trying to produce 20 or 25 pounds of milk. So you can see that there's a, a considerable jump in energy requirement and in, in protein as those animals uh, go further into pregnancy. And energy, mid-pregnancy, late pregnancy, and after calving, they jump by 5% each time, 55, 60, and 65%. If you're using a straw grain ration, you're probably looking at six or seven pounds of grain, uh, 20 pounds of straw in mid-pregnancy, late pregnancy, you're probably up to seven, eight, nine pounds of grain. And then after calving, there's no room for straw. And we'll get into that a little bit more later on. An average hay will be someplace between 60 and 62% TDN. So you're always gonna need a certain amount of grain after calving. Feeder calf nutrient requirements. This is a chart I, I use for purebred animals. So if you've got a 500 pound calf, you need 15% protein. For every 100 pounds larger that that calf grows, you can drop your protein by 1%. Now for a commercial herd, you're probably able to drop that protein requirement by one to one, <clears throat> pardon me, one to one and a half percent. So if we're looking at utilizing poor quality forages, it's, it's best to use them when the requirements are the lowest. So straw, a good filler, can be used in mid and late pregnancy. Doesn't matter what kind of straw. You got your cereal straws, 
you've got the uh, uh, brassica and uh, straws being canola. You've got some of the other uh, uh, legume type straws, the peas, the fab means, and the lentils. They can all work. There's different qualities associated with each one. The amount of leaf that's left on the straw uh, also impacts quality as well. But typically what you find is your protein re proteins levels in the wheat, pea, and faba, or excuse me, the pea, faba, bean, and lentil uh, straws tend to be higher and they also have more calcium than the cereal straws. Canola will have the higher uh, lime or calcium as well, but they do not have as much protein as the peas, faba beans, or lentils. Now, limitation for intake is measured by how much neutral detergent fiber the animals have actually consumed. That's the hardest part of the straw to, to digest. So if the animal eats 1.2% of body weight as straw, that will be the maximum that they can eat because the rumen's full and the animal is satisfied. So that 1,400 pound cow, uh, if you're expecting 35 pounds of total feed intake or dry matter intake per day, uh, you will get a reduction in feed intake when the NDF values are above 60% or someplace in that 27 to 30, uh, 50, or 17 to 21 pounds of straw. That's the maximum that those cows will eat, depending on what type of straw it is. If you're looking at flax straw, those levels will go down by about 50% as well. So you can't just feed straw. You've got to put something else in there. Your typical cereal straw is 5% protein and 43% TDN. So you're going to need roughly eight pounds of barley or nine pounds of rolled oats to meet requirements in a reasonably good environmental condition and the temperatures aren't uh, much below minus 20. But they also, uh, you can see that if you wanna keep on feeding the straw grain ration into late pregnancy, the last three months, your protein and energy levels go up. So your grain is up to 11 and a half uh, of barley, 13 of oats, and then your canola meal at one and a half or two pounds per head per day. They're also going to need limestone at roughly a quarter pound per day, magnesium oxide, a fortified trace mineral salt with selenium, and the vitamins. Now there are products out on the market will that will have the higher calcium, magnesium, trace minerals, and vitamin levels, but I don't know what the prices would be on some of those things. You can get them custom made so you're not mixing on the farm and making life easier for yourself. When we look at swath grazing, it's a great way to reduce overall costs. Yardage will go down. You're not gonna pay 35 to $40 a cow to haul the manure out the next spring out of the feedlot. You also get a 40% improvement in nitrogen retention when the cows are able to drop the manure out in the field or drop the urine out in the field where it needs to be. So it makes a big difference. The dry cows with the lower requirements than lactating cows, they do very well on swath grazing most of the time. Uh, the growing conditions that occurred over the summer and the cutting date or the relative maturity of the crop will influence the amount of protein and energy available to the cows. There's no problems feeding a desiccated crop uh, to animals. Some products you have to have a grazing restriction, not to feed them within X number of days. So others, there's no restriction whatsoever. So read the labels, understand what you want to use before you actually buy it. Now, managing the swath grazing, limit the rotation to three days. So you want to move an electric fence every three days to make sure that they're getting fresh material. Uh, if you have the time and the inclination, it's best to move the wire daily. 
all cereal crops without any kind of legumes or, or mixtures in with that will be calcium and magnesium deficient. And you're probably gonna need something that's either a three to one or a four to one mineral, which is very close to what they use in a feedlot. For corn grazing, same concepts as for swath grazing. The only thing is the cows will eat the cobs the first day, they'll clean up the leaves and anything they can find on the second, and then it'll only be the stalks left the third day. So there's a lot of variability in total energy and protein that's being provided to the cows, but nobody has really uh, had problems with this other than uh, if they're not careful, uh, they might get some downer cows and milk fevers if they're grazing right up to calving when they don't have a high calcium, high magnesium mineral available to them. Again, that three-day rotation or moving this fence line every three days is probably as long as you want to go. This picture is with some calves uh, out grazing with the cows. Typically, you see corn grazing being done only with the dry cow because your corn product, if you compare the whole plant corn in a silage pit, it's no different than what they're grazing. And lots of time that protein is only about 9%. So extra supplementation is needed as well. Straw or slough hay, a 50-50 ration will work but you need to watch out for the calcium and magnesium levels that are available as well. So adding that extra limestone and magnesium is important. So in mid-pregnancy, 15 pounds of straw or slough hay, 15 pounds of green feed works well. Late pregnancy, your, your green feed levels have to go up to 25 pounds and then reduce the straw to 10. So it all depends on the quality of, of the feed that you have, what the feed test reports say, and it's, it's putting the puzzle together so that everything fits and you don't run into a deficiency situation. Low quality forages after calving. In this situation, straw is not an option due to the high fiber, low energy and low protein content. It's a slow digesting feed that takes longer to pass. And the longer it takes to pass through the cow, the less energy there's gonna be coming in because you've got to hook up um, uh, the right amount of grain. So if, if you are forced to go with a straw grain ration after calving, you're probably looking at someplace around 15 to 18 pounds of grain 10 pounds of straw. So the grain has to be fed at least twice a day or, or the feedings have been broken, need to be broken up into two or three parts. So they're not getting 15 pounds of gray, all, grain all in one feeding. You're gonna be short of protein, calcium, magnesium, trace minerals, and vitamins. Now, some of the other things that are available for feeding cows this winter uh, culled potatoes or potato byproducts is something that can be used. Yes, high moisture content, a lot more than silage, but uh, good feed has the same energy content as barley grain when you consider dry matter. Protein, roughly nine to nine and a half percent. If they are raw potatoes, there is some concern with a choking hazard, but when Edmonton potato or some other uh, potato storage unit decides to clean it out and, and uh, give away the culls or charge $10 a ton for culls, put them into a silage bag, let them in sile, have the silage bag on a slight incline, start filling the bag at the lower end of the, of the hill, fill it to the top or until you get to the crown, and after four or five days, you'll notice that there's probably some moisture starting to accumulate or water starting to accumulate in the bottom end of the bag. Cut a small hole and let it drain out. Then you'll have good quality silage to uh, feed to the cows. 
One concern with potatoes, if they've been sitting out in the sun too long or exposed to the sun, uh, they will turn green, no different than what you have in a garden. And the green color may indicate that there's solanines present, which can cause nervous system problems, digestive tract irritations, and a bunch of other samples or symptoms that'll go along. And that's probably the biggest thing is, you know, watch out for those green ones. If you're getting French fries or stale dated French fries from a grocery or fresh French fries from a plant where they've had stuff spill and you can get them, they are great. They've got a higher energy content than just raw potatoes because they can be up to 30% fat. Limits for French fries is no more than about 20% of the entire ration, just to make sure your total fat content does not exceed uh, uh, 7% in the ration. Oops, sorry, I gotta go back one here. Some areas this fall received a bunch of rain and there was good second growth, good quality feed. If it's a cereal or canola, uh, quality 14 to 16% at the bloom stage or at the heading stage, uh, 62 to 65% TDN. So it really makes a big difference on what the animals are gonna consume. And uh, if they're a little bit on the skinny side or if you want those calves to really put on some weight, this is the type of product that'll do a good job for you. Now, nitrates are a concern in all crops. If they've fertilized for a 70 or an 80 bushel crop and they only got 20, then there's going to be a lot of available nitrogen in the soil. So nitrate can, can, accumulation can occur. And with the sulfur or with canola regrowth, the big concern with that is sulfur along with the nitrates. Now talking about nitrates a little bit, cattle are the most susceptible to nitrates. Sheep can tolerate two and a half times more horses, pigs, chickens, either being a modified ruminant or a monogastric, nitrates are not a concern because they can't digest the fiber properly to release the nitrate. And when you do have a nitrate problem and a nitrate feed is consumed, Nitrates are converted to nitrites and then to ammonia. And when the nitrite enters the bloodstream, it changes the form of the hemoglobin to methemoglobin. And what happens there is the change in shape does not allow the release of carbon dioxide in the lungs. So that carbon dioxide just continues to cycle and you become shorter and shorter of, 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 of oxygen. So when you get to 60 or 70 to 80% of met hemoglobin, those animals can possibly die. Before that, you'll see them start to stagger and not really be uh, cooperative with what you wanna do with them. So there are some symptoms available that will tell you when you're running into trouble. But unfortunately, the biggest uh, indicator of nitrate deficient or nitrate accumulation or nitrate poisoning is uh, a dead animal or dead animals. Generally more than 1% concentration is required. The feed test results that come out with saying half a percent is, is poisonous. Uh, they didn't read the literature that Crawford uh, on the work that Crawford did uh, where he found that if you injected sodium nitrate directly into the jugular vein, then at half a percent, yes, you will have problems. But if you're feeding green feed, as long as it's not heated, you can go up to 1% before you have to be concerned. Big trick with nitrates is it's preventable using proper management. <laughs> Need to get let the animals acclimatize. Rumen bacteria will change after three or four days. So the population makeup will change, which makes it more uh, uh, <coughs> makes it more uh, makes the animal more of it. Uh, it. Excuse me. With the change in bacteria, they can digest the nitrates better, therefore less of a problem. The second thing that happens after 
being exposed to renitrates for two weeks, the bone marrow will produce more red blood cells. Toxicity, generally not recognized until the animals are found dead. The only thing you can do is test your feeds. Now with higher sulfur content, if you're grazing canola, uh, in a feedlot situation, 0.4% nitrate or 4.4% sulfur is the point where you're getting a reduction in rumen pH. Sulfur is changed to sulfuric acid when it mixes with water. Bacteria and microbes that are sensitive to the low pHs die off. And these are the ones that typically are able to, to produce the thymine. And without thymine, you get the brain swelling and um, commonly referred to as polio. So there are animals that have lived through polio. Unfortunately, um, there have been losses as well. Some of the alternate protein sources that can be used to uh, supplement the straw grain rations to meet that 7, 9, and 11% protein are peas, lentils, as grain crops. Less expensive if you're able to get screenings from a seed cleaning plant, or if something's gone off a little bit and there's a bit of mold on the peas and they're not uh, accepted by the elevators or the grain companies. But on the other side, when you've got a wheat distiller's plant in Lethbridge, or excuse me, in um, Lloydminster, it's a cheaper source of protein rather than bringing in wheat or, um, excuse me, um, getting the peas from the seed cleaning plant as cracks and splits are cheaper than getting them from, you know, getting good quality. The other alternative is the byproducts, the corn and wheat distillers, which is available after they remove the ethanol. Good protein contents, good energy contents. The only thing you have to be concerned about is your phosphorus contents in the corn and wheat distillers are usually double to triple what you get in a cereal grain, that 0.35 to 0.4%. So your calcium phosphorus ratios can go out of whack in a hurry. Some of the other products that are available, your canola meal, uh, you know, 38% protein, soybean meal of 54. Soybean is extremely expensive to use in a cattle ration, just doesn't make any economic sense. Distillers, grains, corn, or uh, wheat, malt sprout pellets. The other one that can be used is urea, which is a non-protein nitrogen source. So if you've got a 32% supplement and you look at the tag and you see a, a thirst number is 32, which indicates the total amount of protein that's available. And then the 18, which indicates the protein from non-protein nitrogen. That indicates how much urea, <clears throat> pardon me, is included in that, in that supplement. Brewery products, again, with everybody uh, being a far away from a malt plant or a, or a distillery, a little bit tough to get them locally and hard to bring them in because of the high freight, but it is a good option with 28% protein, higher phosphorus, low calcium, 9% fat or, or and reasonable energy or your reasonable fiber contents makes it a good feed. So uh, if there's a dry product and a wet product, and if you're using the wet, you should use it up within two to four days in the summertime because it'll start to mold and limitations on how much you can bring in because weather like we're having today, you're gonna have problems with it freezing into a popsicle and then you'll have to find a way to break it apart. Wheat mids, mill run pellets, byproducts from the wheat milling industry when they're making flour also makes great feed uh, higher pro phosphorus levels again the other thing with the wheat mids and the wheat run pellets is a lot of times you'll get a, uh, a large amount of fine material and that if fed at excessive rates 
may cause bloat problems. Oat hulls, oat groats, good the oat hulls are a good filler to replace straw and oat groats, again, a nice high protein product that you can use. So depends on availability and cost and the freight bill to bring it in, but those are all the options that you can consider on a, on a local or moderate basis. There are companies out there that uh, broker these types of products as well if you need some help finding it. Urea, non-protein nitrogen. Basically, the difference between the urea that you're feeding to the cows and what you're putting onto the fields is they scrub the urea prills or they scrub the urea to remove any potential for heavy metals. So no mercury, uh, uh, no arsenic in the urea that's uh, being fed to cows because these heavy metals will accumulate in an animal with time, lead being another one. So I'm not saying that there's lots of these in the uh, feed or the, the quality of urea that you're putting into the soil, but they're, they are extra careful if they're making a feed grade urea. Animals over 450 pounds are, have a developed rumen or a significant, uh, sufficiently uh, developed rumen so that they can digest the urea as long as there's soluble sugars or soluble starches available and therefore the need for about three to four pounds of grain to utilize the protein that's obtained from the, from the urea. Limitation, no more than 25% of the total protein can come from NPN or urea. That's partly due to the possibility of ammonia toxicity. And also the other thing you have to be careful with is the um, amount of sulfur. You need a minimum of 0.15% sulfur in the ration as well. Using a bale processor uh, to feed cattle, it's an effective way, especially on days like this where you can turn up the heat in the cab and you don't have to freeze your fingers. But there are some downfalls with this, with this system of feeding. Work that was done in Lacombe uh, found that using a ba bale processor and shredding bales onto snow had a 19% feed loss. With the bale unroller, it was down to 13%. But the big thing is your, your amount of protein and calcium lost in these rations is significantly higher than what the physical losses are. And the reason for that is when you put the bales through a bale processor, the fine leaves and uh, flowers typically end up being less than three quarters of an inch in length. And that's where you get 75% of the waste. So that you're losing the highest quality portion of the plant. With the unroller, you're still losing a lot of protein and, and calcium, but the difference is the cows can stop and eat what they need to eat before they have to go back to a feeder or, or to the, the processed feed. So um, it's, it's convenient, but if you want to feed using a bale processor, build yourself a bunk and uh, that way you reduce your, your losses. The bale feeder on the left, was a prototype that we tried to put together for a commercial situation, 28 feet long, five to six feet wide, and about 30 inches tall. That'll hold about a 1,400 pound bale of hay, which will feed 40 cows. To prevent the cows from climbing into that feeder, bring the bottom rails in about 16 inches so that these animals are actually looking at a soup bowl type configuration on that feeder when they start eating, it does two things. It catches a lot more of the feed that <clears throat> or prevents the feed from being trampled on and lost. But the other side of the coin, to, or excuse me, to prevent the cows from walking into the feeder, bring those bottom rails in 12 to 16 inches so that they can't put any weight on one foot before they try to get the second one in there. 
if you're really short of feed and want to keep the cows, they did work back in 2002 where they were feeding only half a percent of body weight uh, for a forage, making up the differential with minerals, vitamins, and supplements. And at that time, corn was relatively cheap compared to barley, so they brought corn in. And what they found was the cows did really well. There was no problems with calving. The cows maintained their condition. Calf birth rates were normal, no, no health problems or minimal health problems. So their conclusion was without having that extensive management and ability to monitor cows almost on the hour, they're saying instead of half a percent uh, mineral, or excuse me, half a percent uh, forages in that ration, go up to 1%. So a typical ration for these cows at that time was 14 pounds of straw, 11 pounds of grain, and a pound of 32% supplement. And you can see what the other rations are keeping the straw down or the forages down, and they're saving about 10 to 12 pounds a day. So it does make a big difference. One of the things that I'm continually getting questions on is the use of liquid molasses on straw bales. It's a product that hangs around all the time. And when feed supplies are tight, they get to be pushed uh, by the players in the feed industry. And you know they, they do supply some nutrients, especially your proteins and some of your trace minerals and vitamins, but minimal impact on energy and calcium, phosphorus, magnesium. So some of the reasons that I've heard that people want to use uh, molasses on straw bales, uh, increasing feed intake, it may encourage them to do so, but the limit of intake is still at 1.2% of NDF. And also the other reason is I'm doing something, I'm helping my cows, and that helps the producer feel good for because they are trying to help. But unfortunately, a lot of times the product is oversold by the salesperson who's, who's uh, portraying themselves to be an expert in nutrition. So typically what we're seeing is any place from 70 to 100 pounds of, and, uh, of uh, molasses being applied per round thousand pound round bale. If, if your product is 25 cents a pound, and I've heard up to 35 cents a pound, your costs can be any place from uh, 17.50 to 25% when you go up to the full 2% of bale weight. So assuming that we've got that thousand pound bale and a round bale is, uh, um, excuse me, when you have that thousand pound bale, a 1400 pound cow will eat rough a maximum of about 20 pounds a day. So they're going to get roughly a pound and a half to two pounds of molasses per head per day. Label, this is one I picked off the website. I'm not criticizing one product over the other, but as you can see, your calcium, phosphorus, magnesium levels are very low does have reasonable trace minerals. Uh, vitamins A and D are good, but your vitamin A is deficient or vitamin E is deficient as well. So it's something that can be used, but what does that do to the feeding program? You do increase your protein content uh, considerably when you're feeding that two pounds of molasses per head per day. But the other thing, the, other, the thing is, again, you're your limitations are how much uh, nitrogen can be supplied or how much protein can be supplied as a uh, NPN source in the total ration. Energy increase is equivalent to about half a pound of barley a day. Your calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium, very little difference as well. So, if you do supply that two pounds of molasses per head per day on 20 pounds of straw, uh, you're going to need about 10 pounds of grain 
uh, barley or about 11 to 11 and a half pounds of oats. So you're also going to need some limestone, magnesium, and vitamin E. Pre-choicing a, a one-to-one mineral or a two-to-one mineral will just not do the trick. You need something more in line of that feedlot mineral that we talked about earlier on with the straw grain rash. Now, salt and mineral supplementation, always recommended. It can take four to six weeks for an animal to recover from a deficiency before they'll really start putting um, larger amounts back into the calf when prior to being born. So it's necessary to you know, figure it out and know what you're doing before it's too late. Free choice mineral intake. What Rob Hand found in Westlock back in the 90s was on average, a cow will come in about once every four and a half to five days to, to eat salt and mineral. Unpro unfortunately, the rate of consumption is variable. Any place from one gram to 770 grams or about 1.6 pounds per day. Calves, yes, they come in a little bit more frequently, but the variability intake for them is also high. So your best bet, try to put it into a grain mix or into a silage uh, type feeding situation so that you know that every time a cow goes in and puts her head into a feeding manger or into a feed trough, they're gonna be getting something for trace minerals and vitamins. So try to mix your salt and vitamin together. Don't feed them separately. Cows do have the craving for salt, but they don't have a craving for mineral. They're not that smart. So in this situation, you know, if you're feeding three to five ounces per head per day, an ounce to an ounce and a quarter of salt, four gram or four, two to four ounces of limestone, half an ounce or a third of an ounce of magnesium oxide plus your vitamins, that's a mixture that may be consumed by the cows. It may not if you're mixing it on, on farm. If they're not eating enough, increase, uh, add some dried molasses to the mixture. Start off with five to seven pounds per bag and then work your way from there. If they're eating too much, decrease the molasses. If they're not eating enough, increase the molasses to try to entice them to get it. So that's where, you know, rule of thumb, if you're feeding a hundred gram product or something in that four ounces a day range, a hundred cows, or 250 cows should go through a 25 kilogram bag of mineral in one day. Processing grain, calves under 200, uh, under 700 pounds are very efficient at chewing grain. They take their time, they chew, and they do a good job. Anything over 700 pounds, it's like a light switch goes on. They try to get as much grain as they can. They gulp their food and they don't chew properly. So 700 pounds and over, you need to process the grain to get your higher feed efficiency and average daily grain, average daily gain, sorry. The rolled grain or processed grain should be about 70 to 75% of original bushel weight, which is called the rolling index. And if it's too light, you're processing it too fine. If it's too heavy, you're not processing enough. So Big thing is your rolling index is important, but also for a high production area, especially in a dairy cow or dairy calves, you only can eat two and a half percent, or excuse me, when you have uh, more than 5% fines in the ration, you can have more problems with bloats and acidosis. So typically, you know, break the wheat, rye, and shredded kale into two pieces only. If it's finer than that, there will be problems with uh, digestive upsets. Barley, break the kernels into two or three pieces. If it's through a roller mill and you can see lines across the kernel and they don't look like they appear to be broken, roll that kernel between your finger and thumb and it should fall into two pieces. Um, if you do have 
a little bit of grain coming through the roller as whole, I'd rather have it that way rather than having the higher percentage of fines. Finding light bushel weight barley could save you some dollars instead of 850 or bushel for that heavyweight barley. You might get away with seven, seven and a half for the lightweight stuff. And they did some work back at the university where they compared 54 pound barley to barley that was down to 37 pounds. And they found no difference in average daily gain or feed conversion efficiency. Pardon me, down to about 42 pounds. The 37 pound barley, there was a 5% reduction in feed efficiency and gain. So anything under 42 pounds reduce uh, performance by 1% per pound. And this also can be applied to uh, pregnant cows as well, how they're able to use the feed. Rumensin and Bovitec is something that should be considered because it improves feed conversion efficiency. On a high forage ration, it reduces the amount of feed that they're actually going to consume on a daily basis. And in a high grain ration, um, it just makes it more efficient. You'll get 5 to 7% efficiency in gain. It's also, both products are COXI preventatives. Uh, also helps prevent rumen digestive upsets and liver abscesses. So last time the numbers were done, it's about a $5 return for every dollar invested with Rumensin or Bovitec. Looking at animals is one way to see how much weight they're carrying. A thin cow, like I said before, requires more feed to stay warm because there's less fat under the hide. And there's also other implications on that. So having a thin cow, uh, visual appraisal, in these, ex in these two examples, you can, a little bit extreme, uh, but you can see that. But when you're looking at a cow that's in good condition, there's a reasonable fat cover over the short ribs, the pin bones, and the tail head. The back line looks fairly round and, um, straight. The animal is able to withstand colder weather and be able to take a little bit more straw, a little bit more hay or grain because they don't have that higher maintenance energy requirement. They also have less problems with uh, calf delivery because the muscles are still there. They're well developed and typically the, the uh, um, the animals just have more muscle condition or muscle tone so that they're able to deliver the calf easier. Moderate condition cows, you can see that this one, you're starting to see an indent above the pin bones. Uh, the, the, the back line is not quite as round and as smooth. There's that triangle uh, where the short ribs are starting to show that cow will need additional grain to be in proper condition by the time it hits calving. This cow, for contrast, I, I made it into a black and white instead of a color slide. You can see the sharpness of the back line, the sharpness of the tail head, uh, short ribs. That animal is probably someplace between two and 300 pounds thinner than what she should be. It'll reduce calf growth rates. Uh, birth weights, overall health and vigor, <coughs> and it will take a fair bit of grain to get that animal back up into good condition by calving. It's not only getting that calf out and having a healthy calf, but when you've got a thin cow, she cannot produce the quality and the amount of colostrum that is needed to have passive immunity. So this is a US system report. They use a one to nine, whereas Canada, we use a one to five. So that six for the US system is equivalent to a three in Canada. And that's where you want the animals to be. You can see that the short-term immunity, the IgM, uh, 
provided is double when that cow is in good condition and about a, a 10 to 15% improvement for long-term or IgG um, immunoglobulin performance. So make some, if you're having troubles with calf scours or uh, sick calves within three, four or five days, that could potentially be caused by thin cows delivering calves. Body condition score also impacts uh, milk yield. The vertical red line is at 12 weeks after calving. That's when you get the maximum feed intake by a, by a cow. But peak lactation occurs at eight weeks. So if there's not enough energy in the ration or if they're not able to mobilize fat off their backs to meet those energy requirements, the peak of the lactation will be lower. And it's not only the peak will be lower, but that reduction in milk production through the entire lactation continues on. So um, when the calves are very young, seven pounds of milk will result in roughly 1% of body gain by weight. So if they have that fat to mobilize, Granted, you don't want the cows losing weight between calving and, and, and uh, breeding season, but if they have to take a little bit of weight off to increase the peak yield, it's a good thing for the calf. <coughs> Thin cows going into calving, they have problems coming back into heat. You can see that when the bolts were turned out at 90 days in this experiment, only 66% of the cows actually uh, we're cycling. The cows that were in good condition, 90% or 91% of them were actually cycling uh, 30 days prior to the bulls being turned out, and they were all able to conceive or, or had the capability to conceive a calf because they were cycling by the time the bulls were put in. Thin cows take more services to become pregnant and usually what you'll find is a lot more calves end up in the late portion of the, of the calving season as well. How do you evaluate the quality of the ration that you're actually providing to the cows when you are feeding the straw grain? Uh, room and fill is one thing. If you're short of protein, if you're looking at an animal from the backside, you'll see the uh, rumen distended on the left-hand side of the animal or, or big being large on the left-hand side of the animal. If it's severe enough, you might see a, a barrel type situation on that cow. The other thing you can do is look at the manure. If the manure is relatively flat and looks like a pie, then you've got, prob you've got enough energy and protein in that ration. If you look at the picture of the manure on the left-hand side, you don't want that because that's an indication that the stomach is acidotic and uh, digestive problems are occurring. If you've got that low quality ration and you can see the manure looking more like uh, stacked onion rings or a pyramid shape, you've got too much protein or too much fiber, not enough protein to to keep the rumen bacteria alive to digest that fiber and it's taking longer for that feed to pass through the animal and you're just getting poor digestion and poor, poor utilization of the nutrients that are there. If it goes far enough, you could potentially have impaction problems. How to remedy that problem? reduce the amount of low quality forages in the ration, put more silage or straw, uh, silage, hay, or if you need to add a little bit of a protein supplement and grain to that ration so that it will bring that NDF value down. Now, when you do provide that extra grain, yes, you're gonna increase weight gain and body condition, but if they're putting out manure like that three to four weeks prior to calving, it's better to get it done there to at least have some sort of um, uh, protection, but um, it, all, it all has to fit together. It's like I said before, it's a jigsaw puzzle. In conclusion, it's hard to put together the ration when you don't have uh, feed test results. 
use the lower quality feeds in early winter to reduce costs and still meet animal requirements. Watch body condition, watch the manure to see if the program is working properly. If you need help, ask for advice. There's nutritionists with feed companies, forage associations may or may not have somebody to help. Um, you can always look at somebody private like what I'm doing right now as well. And I'm not pushing for business. It's just an option that's out there. Feed the first calf heifers and thin cows separately from the main herd so that they do get back up in good condition before calving. It's a couple of the tricks that work very well. So uh, any questions? There's my contact information. Lance, I'm gonna turn it back to you and uh, take it away. Sounds good. Yeah, no, I just wanted to thank you, Barry, for today. Yeah, we had a bit of a problem here with our registration, but uh, yeah, we're recording right now and gonna make it available to, to everyone that's registered and uh, go from there. But um, I might have a quick question for you and then I'll open it up to everyone else too. But uh, is there any difference between the, the dry and liquid molasses products? Or is that just, they're all the same at the end of the day, I suppose. If it's just straight molasses, the difference is either 40% water or 5% water. Okay. The 32% liquid molasses supplement does have the protein, vitamins, and trace minerals in it, whereas dried molasses typically is only starch and a little bit of energy. Oh, okay. I understand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the program that is available through the Forge Association for help with this, with ration balancing? I know Margaret's going to, is asking yeah. for help already, but you want to explain the program? Yeah, sure, sure, Barry. Yeah, so essentially, um, through the, the Forage Associations, um, or through Erica, essentially. Uh, so we did get some uh, cat money for the uh, grant specialists, and Barry is one of them as well. So if you do have questions with regards to um, nutrient um, rationing or balancing and things like that, or options for low, uh, low uh, feed supply, um, you just get in touch with myself and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reach out to Barry and, uh, and do that connection for you. And um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the best way to, to get more information. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll go at it that way. Uh, so Barry's one resource. Another one is Grant Mastuka, Bill Chapman, Neil Watley, and um, I think uh, Ted Nyborg. But um, so all of those experts are available to uh, to everyone, and uh, you just need to reach out to your local uh, um, applied research association, and we'll uh, we'll make that connection for you. The nice thing about the program is the pilot project has money available to pay the consulting fees so there's no cost to you out of your pocket when you go through this program yeah that's right yeah yeah so yeah yeah definitely and we've made use of it quite a bit here on our end and uh really nice nice way to connect with the with the experts and and uh, yeah, but uh, 